And our next speaker is Melissa Leach, who is a social anthropologist from uh, <coughs> specializing in environmental and social uh, science society issues. She is the director of the inter interdisciplinary center STEPS in the UK yeah. and a research fellow of the Institute of Development Studies. And in your research projects, Melissa, I know that you have uh, integrated social science with science policy and natural sciences, yeah. and very often in Africa. And I yeah. know that you speak four African languages. Badly. Badly? Actually. Can you say, can you I say have done. from which part? Which um, uh, the... Kisi and Malinke from Guinea, and um, Mende from Sierra Leone, and Creole, which is a pidgin language in Sierra Leone, also. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> And um, your recent work, you have explored the politics of science and the, the knowledge in policies, processes linked to environment and health. Yeah. And you're also vice chair of the Future Earth Science Committee. Yeah, yeah. Well. good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And I think um, my talk and the couple that follow are going to move us into the realm of what social sciences also have to offer to these enormous challenges we're facing um, of both understanding and finding ways through and futures in the Anthropocene. So my starting point um, is people and the development threats that we're seeing as part of and the fallout of the processes that, that Johan and others have outlined for us. Because in um, a constrained world where we're already beginning to see the ecological stresses as we enter those danger zones and push up against planetary boundaries. Some of the most um, drastic effects are being felt by people who are already poor and marginalized. And they're being felt in the intensification in many parts of the world of poverty, of deprivation, of ill-being, of ill health, and of scarcities of many kinds. Now, crucially, these impacts don't happen as a direct result of ecological threats and pressures, but they're very much mediated by the political, the social, the institutional, by questions about access, who has access to diminishing resources within um, a planetary operating space, who gains and who loses as a result of intensified competition and struggles over that space. So We've heard about planetary boundaries and the notion of a safe space for humanity that, that they help to define. But in my view, we also need to be thinking about a just space and a space in which people, all people, can meet their basic human rights. Rights for over material resources, needs for food and water um, and energy, but also rights to be heard rights for status and dignity and well-being um, in everyday life. And this diagram comes from Kate Rayworth's work um, and what she calls the donut, using a, a joking fast food analogy to capture this idea that if we think not just about environmental ceilings and planetary boundaries, but also about the social foundations which are necessary for individuals to meet their, their human rights, we're left with a donut-shaped space in between, which she refers to as a safe and just space for humanity. This, I would suggest, is where we need to be and to be moving into in the future. And at the moment, we're far from it, just as we're pushing up against and sometimes exceeding those environmental ceilings. So um, indicators globally around many of these social foundations fall far below that floor at a global level, and then with many local variations and impacts. So we're faced with some pretty urgent challenges, challenges that my colleagues and I in the STEP Centre think about in terms of building pathways to sustainability. But this is sustainability that's not just about ecological integrity. It's also fundamentally about social equality, and it's about well-being and security for people. It's about integrating those things but also about questioning what they mean to different people in different parts of the world at different times. And there are some pretty big challenges there. And they're challenges that are, in large part, about steering. If we think about that, that donut-shaped space, this is a little section of it which suggests that we might imagine a whole range of different pathways through which our systems are moving, systems that are at the same time technological, social, institutional, biophysical. 
And, and we can envisage them kind of moving along trajectories in directions. Some of those are moving us away from, breaching planetary boundaries. Others are going to be taking society below those social foundations, undermining those human rights. But in the middle, we might begin to imagine, think about building a range of safe and just pathways while recognizing that there's going to be a large range of possibilities. There's no one, there's going to be a lot of them. Building those pathways is in turn going to need everybody's creativity. Transformations. It's pretty clear from even those Anthropocene graphs that business as usual is not enough. It's not moving us in the right directions. So we need to think about transformative pathways. And two key elements of those are innovation, which we can think about simply as new ways of doing things. It might involve technologies, technologies for energy, technologies for capturing carbon, technologies for delivering food and growing crops. But critical, too, are the social and the economic and political arrangements which make those technologies work in particular places. And then there's what one can very broadly term governance, by which I mean the political and institutional processes and indeed power knowledge processes, how we come to know about things and what kinds of knowledge help to define them, which are going to shape how innovations emerge, what they do, for whom, where and how. Three questions that in the Step Centre we often ask of pathways, of innovation, of governance, of policy approaches, um, can be captured by three Ds. We need to think hard about the directions that different pathways are moving in, whether they're moving us outside or below those um, safe and just operating spaces, and also about steering. What are the goals, the interests, the values that are driving particular pathways? Um, take something like fossil-fueled energy pathways, and those driving forces include locked-in energy infrastructures, the political economic interests of energy companies, and a whole range of other factors. These are the things we need to challenge to re-steer. But we also need to think about diversity for a number of reasons. We heard about the importance of diversity and redundance in this recent paper in the last presentation. Diversity is critical it's important to open up and resist the lock-in to single pathways. It's important to build resilience in these very uncertain situations we're often in. But it's also crucial to respond to the endless variety of concepts, of values, of goals that we see for different groups, different people in different societies in different places across the world. And then the third D is distribution. We need to be asking carefully and hard, who are the winners and losers? from the pathways that we're on and from the alternatives. And to think about how the choices that societies make will affect inequalities. Inequalities in resource access and control, inequalities in wealth and power, but also inequalities of opportunity. So a lot of this I often talk about as a politics of pathways in which we need to be very attuned to the contestations and the trade-offs as well as the opportunities to build alternatives. A lot of this symposium is about the global. Global change is critical. It's global boundaries and thresholds that ultimately are going to shape the future of humanity on our planet. But many of the solutions and opportunities, and indeed many of the impacts and problems, are also felt locally and at many scales in between. So as well as thinking about global conventions, technologies, rolling out solutions at scale, innovation and governance at that level. I would argue that we also need to be keeping a very close eye on the local. There are enormous opportunities, as I'll outline in a moment, for grassroots forms of innovation, for capturing the creativity and the knowledge of people in diverse places, and for building alternatives at community level, which then offer the opportunities for scaling up and out, not in a one-size-fits-all way, but in a way that moves out and adapts to different kinds of circumstances. And that means paying attention to those mesoscale relationships in governance and in the fostering of innovation um, in localities, in national settings, and in regions. So... I want now to go on to talk a little bit about how meeting these challenges, building these pathways to sustainability, requires, I think, some new ways of thinking about and doing science. 
and some new ways of engaging science with governance, with action. And I'm going to give two very brief examples from some of the work I'm currently engaged in, not because they um, are the ultimate in examples, but I think they, they illustrate some of the challenges and also draw across these global and local settings. And then I'm going to, to conclude by showing a little bit of how Future Earth, as, as it were, the new game in town, is intending to meet precisely these challenges. So my first example um, relates environment to health. Health is a critical area of well-being or ill-being, um, attracting greater attention. And one particular aspect is the emergence of zoonotic diseases that transmit from animals to people. We've heard a lot, newspaper headlines over the last few years have drawn attention to emerging threats from SARS, from avian influenza, from viruses transmitted by bats and rodents, um, and of emerging infectious disease events over, the, over precisely this Anthropocene period. Um, a large proportion are of animal origin. There are global drivers to these things in the ways that vectors are moving around the world um, under, shaped by climate and land use change, and there are threats to global populations, which is often what hits the headlines. But there are also some crucial local interactions and local impacts. And a large consortium project called Dynamic Drivers of Disease in Africa that I'm, I'm leading at the moment is tracking these relationships for four diseases, all of which are underrepresented in research and policy at the moment, but all of which have enormous impacts on poverty and livelihoods, either by directly affecting human health or by affecting the health of livestock, in the case of Rift Valley fever and trypanosomiasis, thus devastating the local economies that development is depending on. What's crucial, and the point I want to emphasize, this is, is that untangling these multi-scale interactions is requiring the garnering of all sorts of different expertises, working in an integrated way. We've actually got 19 institutions involved in this consortium that range from top-level epidemiology and veterinary science to people who do macroecology and modeling to people who, like myself, do participatory work and social science and anthropology. And this is enabling us to, to look both at the intricacies of disease dynamics, of transmission, of exposure and risk, how that's shaped by the ways that people in their everyday lives interact with animals, move around the landscape, become exposed to bats and rodents and other disease vectors um, in their use of ecosystem services, and then the trade-offs between how people use land and, and food and forest resources for their livelihoods, but then the risks that that creates in terms of them coming in contact with disease vectors. But then scaling up, we're using macroecological modeling approaches to think about how those local systems are shaped by larger scale drivers um, at the continental and even global scale. And then over on the left, we've got a, a theme which is asking not just about these material interactions, but also how different stakeholder groups, local people, frontline workers, government departments, and international agencies across health and environment, think about them and how that affects their responses. And through this kind of interconnected work, we're engaging stakeholders in a kind of process of co-design. And all of the institutions, all of the case studies involved in this work, actually involve government departments and development actors as part of the research teams. And this is enabling us to think from the outset in quite practical ways about how understanding can be linked with ways of managing ecosystems and services in ways that are sustainable in ecological terms, but also reduce these risks and vulnerabilities for people who are already poor. And then scaling up to think about how we can predict and manage some of the national and global scale risks emerging from changing environment, people, disease interactions. And innovations are emerging already. Some of them are very local and practical. This um, is a, a set of metal strips that villagers in Sierra Leone put on their rice stores to deter Lassa fever carrying rodents from attacking their food sources and hanging out in their rice stores. At the top, we have a bamboo skirt that villagers in Bangladesh, linked to our um, earlier work that preceded our project, invented to stop fruit bats urinating in the containers they used to collect date palm sap. Um, and which are now being produced and sold through social entrepreneurs 
um, in a scaled-up intervention. But innovations, too, are in thinking about policy in integrated ways. How do we get veterinary policy, development policy, agricultural policy, and, um, and health policy working in a coordinated fashion? And then thinking about surveillance, not just of disease as it emerges, picking up the cases, but of the system tipping points and processes that are making people vulnerable in the first place. My second example, just quickly, focuses in on what's often called the trilemma of climate change effects, food insecurity, and rapid land use change, which in many parts of the world are facing people with integrated problems. And clearly, each of these elements um, creates global challenges around which we've seen an array of innovations and governance approaches which look to technologies for sequestering carbon, which look to or, or growing food crops, and which look to market arrangements, markets for, markets for carbon, trading systems, ways of valuing ecosystem services at multiple scales. But here, too, we've got integrated community-level approaches, which we're beginning to offer ways forward, whether in integrated forms of valuing and managing multiple ecosystem services, as we see here on the left, or indeed in technologies linked to social arrangements that can give one multiple wins. And one that I've been tracking and involved in is biochar, which basically says if we can use biomass fuels in the right kind of kiln or stove, we generate charcoal-rich products, which then, if buried in the ground, both fix carbon and give one some massive, rather exciting upgrades to soil fertility, which then enable people to crop and produce food more effectively and to retain soil moisture and give you ad adaptive capacities to climate change. Fine, okay, that's the starting point, but um, processes have struggled to attune biochar to local landscapes. I've been involved in a project which has linked anthropologists, historians, and soil scientists over the last few years, which has been discovering and then working with indigenous, human-created dark earths that already are fixing and sequestering carbon with enormous soil fertility benefits. The inspiration for this work comes from the ancient dark terra preta soils, which have now been found to cover about 10% of the soil surfaces underneath the Amazon rainforests. But our work has shown that very similar analogues of these dark earths are currently forming and being created by farmers in large parts of Africa. We've been focusing on, on four countries in West Africa. And what we're seeing here is farmers' own everyday knowledge and practices in waste disposal, in the burying of charcoal, in rings around their settlements, such as to form these very deep, dark, rich soils which absolutely stand up to the qualities of these Amazonian dark earths and particularly very large quantities of black carbon forming over a period of decades on into the future. Um, so soil science is validating local creativity and these soils are crucial to people's food production in these parts of the world. So what we're seeing here is an example of an indigenous African soil enrichment process, which could offer a climate-smart alternative, a sustainable agriculture way forward. Again, not for everywhere, but something to build on in thinking about alternative pathways. So if I could just have a couple more minutes. This leads me to suggest, I think these examples show that thinking about steering pathways to sustainability requires some new kinds of ways of doing science. It needs to be interdisciplinary. There are enormous grounds to be gained in really bringing the social and the natural biophysical sciences together. But it also, crucially, needs to be transdisciplinary. It needs to integrate the science with the stakeholders who are going to be able to engage and use it from the outset. These dark earth processes have now been picked up by NGOs in Ethiopia who are developing and marketing indigenous fertilizers. Um, that's an example of engagement taking things on through business, actually, into the future. But it also involves dialogue, bringing often quite different forms of knowledge and ways of thinking and doing science together. Not easy. It requires humility. It requires all of us to be a bit reflexive and self-critical about our own disciplines and be open to other ways of thinking and learning. And then this has to engage with governance, which, as I've defined very broadly encompasses quite a lot of challenges. It needs, as I've suggested, to be multi-scale. 
it needs to be adaptive because single blueprint solutions aren't going to work. We need to, to begin to change things, then learn from them, respond to them, and change again. It needs to be deliberative. It's partly about bringing different perspectives, goals, framings into the same space so that often very diverse groups and stakeholders can think together. And there's a lot to be gained from networked approaches, which are combining the actions and the interests of governmental and business partners, as well as civil society in new forms of alliance. Future Earth, which I'm absolutely delighted to be co-chairing the Science Committee of, is trying to bring about, to envision and really bring about a step change in work of this kind. These are the, the formal kind of aims of Future Earth. It's a global platform, but some of these keywords are really important. It's about integrated research. It's about co-design, so one gets the other stakeholders in from the beginning to think about the questions and then actually work in co-production and co-communication. And these, I think, are crucial elements if we're to have that kind of solutions-oriented science that the world is now going to need. The three themes of Future Earth um, have been defined in ways that enable this integration to happen. So dynamic planet is not just about biophysical states and trends, but it's also about the ways that societal systems are interacting with and shaping them. The global development theme um, is about questions of, of access, of equity, of security, of stewardship in ways that interact very much with these biophysical processes. And then the transformation theme, which in many ways needs to lead and take us into the future, critically combines innovation and governance and is going to need all of our skills in thinking really innovatively and creatively about those things. And the structures that are being set up now to deliver on this, this new game in town are again very integrated. There's a science committee and an engagement committee, but as we agreed at our first face-to-face -face meeting of the science committee last week, these need to work in tandem and in a thoroughly integrated way. We'll be having joint meetings into the future, um, and that will be working across all the themes at all scales, a 10-year vision, medium-term research priorities, and some quick <coughs> wins that we hope can get a large world of science and governance thinking in these new ways. So I'd really just like to conclude by inviting everybody to join the, join the debate. There is no debate that's more important or more challenging, and it's going to require us all. Thank you.